May the words of my mouth and the meditation of each of our hearts be acceptable to you this day, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Don't cry. Don't cry. These were words that I heard regularly growing up in a household headed by my mother who spent her life trying to pretend that everything was fine, even when it clearly wasn't. It wasn't that my mom wasn't compassionate. She was. It wasn't that my mom was not willing to be concerned for others. She was just obsessed with keeping everything upbeat and cheerful. And it's not that life was always so cheerful. It wasn't. But as one given to extreme moods, she was an expert at creating a sense of false bravado. As her children, my sisters and I were expected to follow in our mother's footsteps and find a way to smile through the most difficult of struggles. It will be okay, my mother always assured us many times in the face of overwhelming evidence that indeed it would most certainly not be okay. Even as my half sister was dying of cancer, my mom was still like a cheerleader at her bedside telling her that everything was going to be fine. It wasn't. Jill was dying and she knew it. Even my mom knew it. She just couldn't bring herself to face it. Now, don't get me wrong. My mom was a wonderful person who was compassionate and dedicated to her daughters. She was, I believe, a victim of a culture that doesn't want to deal with the dark side of life, a society that wants to look at life through rose-colored glasses with a perpetual smile pasted on its face. Miriam Greenspan, in her book, Healing Through the Dark Emotions, would say that my mom was a citizen of a nation that believes that with the right effort, we can completely eradicate emotional suffering. You may know a friend or two, like my mom, who thinks that with a wave of a hand and a fresh application of lipstick and a deep breath, those are the only things that we would need to overcome the shadows that play at the edges of our lives. Perhaps you are even a person who can fall prey to that perpetual mantra, everything is fine, everything is fine, everything is fine. Maybe it's because of that aspect of my upbringing that I find this text from Matthew and the season of Lent so compelling. Lent to me is a gift. It's a time of year when, like Jesus following his baptism, we are sent out into the wilderness to wander around for a while, fasting, praying, and facing our fears and our own personal devils. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, what is the matter with this woman that she would say that she actually enjoys this kind of struggle? But think about it for just a moment. We live in a world where we try to make everything in our lives seem okay. We delude ourselves all of the time with this false bravado, and sometimes doesn't it just get exhausting? We live in a noisy, busy world where we are surrounded with action and sounds that keep our minds constantly busy. Now, of course, some of our actions can be for good. We might be busy helping others or reaching out to those in need, speaking truth to power or making a difference in the world. So am I suggesting that we stop doing th these things, that there is something wrong with doing good in the world? No, of course, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not in any way implying that those kinds of activities are bad. But I do think that oftentimes we, when we engage in all of this, we do so in part to keep from having to stop 
and face our fears, those places deep down inside of us that God most wants to reach. We become perpetual motion machines busy with all kinds of actions. And in this way, avoid the need to stop and look deep within ourselves. And then Lent arrives. And like Jesus, we are invited to spend a little time out wandering in the wilderness. The interesting thing about the desert is that there, there is nowhere to hide. And there amidst this vast expanse of sand and wind, we are exposed and vulnerable. We have time to think. We have time to pray. Not the quick daily prayers that offer thanks and seek intercession for those around us, but the long contemplative conversations that include long periods of silence when we can hear the still, small voice of God. It's in this time in the desert when our televisions can't be plugged in and our phones can't find a signal that we have nothing left but to bear our souls before God and admit our fears and our brokenness. And when we do, we find this amazing gift because there we are met by a God who loves us, a God who is waiting with open arms to restore us in the confidence and hope, a God who will accept us just as we are, even when we can't accept ourselves, a God who assures us that everything is indeed not okay, and that is exactly okay. It is here in the wilderness when we turn to God in utter dependence that we are led to freedom, to what the prolific writer and theologian Henry Nouwen has called a vaster way of living. But life in the desert can be tricky. Like Jesus who was tempted repeatedly by the devil, we too will face temptations there. We will be taunted by others with lures to turn away from our suffering. Why endure pain, they will call out to us as they dangle a myriad of tools and distractions to keep us from feeling anything negative and allow us to continue our addiction to life at the surface. A little retail therapy a voyeuristic obsession with other people's pain, a host of toys and baubles and possessions and tragic spectacles to attract our attention. Like the tempter who dares Jesus to claim that his power is greater than God's, we too will be tempted to believe that we have no need for the one who will bear us up and keep us from dashing our foot against a stone. There is more power in possessions, we will be warned. Getting ahead, finding success, reaching achievement, these are the things that will really keep us safe, some will tell us. These messages bombard us from all angles. We're told that we are held up by the angels of commerce. If we own the right car, live in the right neighborhood, and succeed at the right job, then everything will be okay. Jesus responds to the temptation by proclaiming, again, it is written, do not put your Lord God to the test. As we are similarly tempted, will we put God to the test? Or will we, like Jesus, refuse to do so. Yes, the desert can be lonely. Yes, the temptations can be great, but what an opportunity to be still for just a little while, to be relieved of the pressure to keep up appearances, to let go of the stress of thinking that we are, or even that we could be in control. Here, in the quietness of the wilderness, we can finally be free to be our true selves, finally let down our guard in the solitude. 
we can turn to God and empty ourselves of the hurt, the pain, the insecurity, the humanness, and know that we are loved. And so my friends, as we enter the season of Lent, I invite you to join me on this journey. Travel lightly, letting go of more and more as you truck deeper and deeper into the wilderness. Go slowly. Do as the white rabbit orders in Alice in Wonderland and don't just do something, stand there. Quiet your soul. Listen closely to God calling out to you. Revel in the freedom of being cared for and loved by one whose power is so far greater than your own. In this time and place, let us respond to Nowen's call to move from action to passion, from being in control to being dependent, from taking initiative to having to wait, from living to dying, that we may be reborn to a vaster way of living. This year, rather than trying to skip over that part of the journey that demands sacrifice, rather than taking the detour that jumps ahead to resurrection joy. Let's slow down and savor the invitation into the wilderness. As we travel toward Easter this year, soak up the silence, revel in the gift of being dependent, take time to discern a spirituality of imperfection. For it is in admitting our own limitations our own need for rest, that we are finally free to accept the unbelievable gift of God's amazing grace and abiding love. This Lent, let's relish that vaster way of living as people of God. Amen. <laughs>